So it's been a long day. We know you're tired. So we thought very carefully, how do we keep this audience awake? Yeah? And we decided, you know, having six omnibus and tax advocates on the same platform, well, if they can't keep you awake, nobody can, yeah? Uh, so it's, um, I hope we, we achieve that, because we know you're all dying to get the Austrian wine, the Austrian food, yeah? Uh, and we will finish at uh, 7 o'clock on time, I guarantee that. The topic is the, the challenge of scrutiny in the entities. It's a very hard topic to say, yeah? so you particularly at the end of the night. No, no, yeah. Blame Ali. Yeah. Uh, and we have a great panel here. Um, our good um, uh, chair from Canada, who is the, 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 the tax omnibus man. Omnibus man, it's a strange one. Yes. yes no. uh, I don't think, Ali, you need any more introductions, yes? <laughs> Eric, in fact, who is the South African tax ombudsman, very pleased to have you. Uh, I'll skip this young lady on my left, yeah, because I think you know who she is. Uh, Anders, who is the, uh, the, the Swedish tax ombudsman, and then Diana, who is the tax advocate. Lots of different terms here, but I mean, basically, you're doing the same job, yeah? yeah? Exactly, very different. I hope, anyway, yeah. Uh, so, you know, the rules of the game here is we're, we're, it's going to be a very informal, it's going to be an interactive discussion between the group. I do not know how I'm going to manage. I mean, normally these fireside chats are one to one, yeah? This is one to six, yeah? So it's going to be an interesting challenge, but, you know, they promised me they're going to be very disciplined uh, and very short in terms of their interventions, yes? Uh, we'll have, uh, we have, apart from the audience that is here, there's a virtual audience of about 50 people from around the world, lots of South Africans, I should tell you, yes? We have Brazilians, Chinese, a whole bunch of people out there, yeah? So welcome for those that are not here physically. Um, we, we're going to have four rounds um, of the discussions, um, and I'll sort of kick off each round with a, a question. The first one is, what's the, the environment? How is it changing within which tax administrations operate? Uh, the second one is then looking at, you know, how do you offices function? Because, I mean, just talking to a few people in the coffee break, I think, you know, it's a bit of a black box for the, the outsider, yeah? What do you do, yeah? So um, we, we'll spend a bit of time on that. And then perhaps one of the most important uh, round will be the second, a third round, which is how do you maintain this balance between having a, an adult relationship, you know, with the tax administration but not being too close, yeah? And then finally, I'll ask you to give me sort of what do you see as some of the main changes coming up over the next five years that are going to affect um, how you function, yeah? So that's the structure. So why don't we turn to the first round then, which is the change in environment. Um, you know, and, and I think it's fair to say I've never seen the, the environment, the tax environment changing so dramatically. Um, you know, we have this expectation on the part of citizens that government have to be accountable, they have to be open. Tax administrations are not immune to that. We have technology that is changing the way that taxpayers, tax advisors, and governments interact. Yeah? Uh, we have globalization, um, you know, not just of multinationals, of the professions, but increasingly global cooperation uh, between tax administrations. Um, we have the, the whole transparency debate, yeah? the tax transparency. I mean, I like to say we, we're now at a situation where, from the perspective of a tax a commissioner, it's like Christmas all the year round, because you have so much information, yeah? Uh, I mean, it's great if you want to insulate your walls of your office, yeah? I mean, uh, so how is that going to affect um, the, the way that you operate? And, and asking the questions, you know, how do you reconcile the fact that governments are putting more demands uh, on tax administrations to get the right balance between service and enforcement, and at the same time, in many countries, they're cutting back on resources, yes? So th those are some of the things I thought we would kick off with. And I thought maybe, Diana, you could give us perhaps, what, what do you see how these, how these changes are affecting the way that you operate in Mexico? Well, Jeffrey, definitely we are living very difficult times. I think the governments in a lot of countries are suffering a severe, a severe crisis in the legitimacy of its power. And Mexico has um, particular history and nowadays we are trying to reform our legal system in order to give to the citizens more transparency, more accountability from the entities of the public power. And in this task, I think that PRODECON, uh, La Procuraduría de la Defensa del Contribuyente, as an ombudsman, plays definitely a very important role in order to transparent to everybody the, if the tax administration is acting 
well or wrong? I think, I think that. What, what about South Africa? Where do you come out? I mean, because in a sense, I mean, you have a lot of changes over the last few years, yes? So. Yes, we, we had a lot of changes in the past few years. And uh, also as an institution, uh, when we set it up, uh, which is three years ago, uh, there, were, there were a lot of shortcomings in, in regard to the legislation that guided us. But right now, uh, but I will touch on that at a later stage, but what the, the expectations from society, it's, uh, it's incredible right now. Uh, recently we had a, a constitutional court uh, deciding uh, based on the, in fact there was a challenge by, um, by a political party uh, regarding the recommendations that were made by the public protector and the court held that the recommendations made by the public protector were, were binding and it so happened that it affected the president. So in effect, the president had to make a payment because the public protector had made recommendations that the, um, the president should make a payment towards uh, some of the improvements that were made to his, ho his house. Um, this is not the famous swimming pool. Yeah, that's is. not, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, what, what is happening, the expectations are too high, you know, on uh, oversight bodies, uh, as you can imagine. The next thing, the next question that is going to be asked, you know, what is the status of the, what are the status of the recommendations made by the Ombud? Uh, what are, are they binding? But here, le legislation uh, say, stated that they were not binding. So we had to make some of the adjustment and improvement on that to say that, however, where the revenue authority chooses not to implement the recommendations made by the ombud, there must be an explanation as to why. And then there must be reasons, and not only that, it must be done within a specified period. So you have this kind of uh, changes that we had to implement and effect. Bearing in mind that the body and oversight bodies really do not necessarily make binding decisions, but we had to adapt and change because there's more accountability. And more than that, you also have uh, civil society uh, being able to challenge the government, uh, challenge everyone, and uh, wanting accountability. And uh, not only that, I mean, today or yesterday, we had to actually issue a public statement to say that uh, we are now going to initiate an investigation into whether um, the Revenue Authority is deliberately withholding refunds in order to massage the performance. This is like right almost at the end of the financial year. So where it's, if the revenue authority is owing taxpayers uh, and, and they don't pay, they only delay that, I mean, that there's a perception. The, the perception is that they're delaying the payment of those refunds to taxpayers so that their performance can do great and only pay them in April once the, uh, the, uh, the, the financial year is over. So you, you have that, and this is something that we're now initiating simply because there's been a public outcry. So you have transparency, accountability, and many other things that are really, um, with that we are operating in, in, in at the moment. Sounds like quite a tough political environment, yeah? I mean, what about Ali in Australia? In a sense, Australia has moved probably furthest down the tax transparency path than almost any other country, yeah? You happy with that? They made your job more interesting? Um, look, uh, obviously I'm here as an official and uh, my job is not to really comment on policy but on tax administration, so I need to be mindful of that. But I think that, as I said earlier this morning, as far as transparency goes, I, it, to some extent, uh, whether through mandated legislation or whether it is leaks or whether it is through social media, I think there's going to be a lot more information out there and we just need to uh, charter a way of making sure that it's used for good, that it does positively shape tax policy and tax debate uh, and avoid, um, uh, you know, uh, 
in effect uh, destroying the reputation of the very companies that feed us uh, and also an undermining of confidence in the system. Um, I think in terms of a broader challenge uh, is that, you know, in an environment where the media and um, the public debate is around, um, you know, uh, that there are tax cheats, that there are people gaming the system that must be caught, uh, we do have an emboldened revenue agencies around the world. And I think the job of, uh, in, you know, inspector generals of tax like myself or ombudsmen or uh, taxpayer advocates, it's going to be in increasingly tougher. Um, and that we need to make sure that, uh, or, or we, need, we need to do our best to ensure that uh, taxpayer rights uh, or taxpayer protections uh, are not overly infringed. Um, I think I've said quite a lot, so I might just stop there and allow some of my comments. Sure, we'll come back to you. I mean, but I think this, this whole concept of, I mean, I'd like to say we, we're in an era where your auditors are BEPs empowered, yeah? Uh, and that's why I think we're going to end up with a lot more disputes because, and it's linked to the point that you were making that if a country sets the auditor revenue targets, yes, uh, and very unsophisticated revenue targets, I'm not sure that's the right, the right approach, yes? Chair, what about Canada, yeah? I think, you know, from a lot of the points that uh, my colleagues here have, have pointed out, we live in a time of global information. So you mentioned the emboldened uh, tax administrations with uh, the, the leaks and the, the um, tax havens and evasions and whatnot. We also have an emboldened taxpayer population who have much greater expectations than in previous years. Um, their expectation is if those people could get away with it for that long, why am I not being treated similarly? Why am I being audited or picked on as they perceive? So there, there's greater expectations and knowledge in that way. And I think that's part of it is, you know, we, we very much have to keep in mind the taxpayers who aren't knowledgeable, but generally taxpayers have greater knowledge than I think they did in previous years. And with that knowledge, there comes much greater expectations. So they're expecting um, better service is one of the big things. They're expecting better transparency, more accountability, and they're expecting that they're going to be treated the same as every other taxpayer. Yeah, and it's not enough to change the terminology from taxpayer to client or customer, I think, yeah? There has to be a yeah. change in culture. I want to pick up maybe one point, Eric, that you raised, and perhaps ask Anders, this issue of the role of NGOs, yes? Because, I mean, you have a lot of NGOs in, in, in Sweden, yeah? Has that changed the, your job? Yeah? Oh, uh, non-governmental organizations, you know, Oxfam, Christian Aid, oh, yeah. Tax Justice Network, yeah. you name them, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that changed the role of the ombuds, yeah. no, I, I can't say that I've noticed any of that. Uh, uh, there, there are, um, uh, in later times, there's been uh, some organizations founded uh, working specifically with taxpayers' rights, and they are trying to found, found and cases and things like that, but um, to this day, this is a very small, uh, very small fundings and very few cases. So I don't think it changed so much for us yet. Maybe uh, Nina, I mean, you, your environment has changed quite dramatically. Yes, <laughs> um, I think you know, uh, my office has survived many. Um, administrations, both Republican and Democrat, um, and uh, uh, I think that ta because of the United States culture, um, which I think Rick, Rick, Rick discussed, you know, um, the history about where we started in, in our founding of the country, the anti-tax movement, really. Um, that there is a dislike and a distrust of taxes. And so when you talk about taxpayer rights, that's a bipartisan issue. And to me, what is not, what is the biggest challenge, both for me personally, leading an organization of now about 1,800 employees, down from 2,200 when I came in, in 2001, um, is the issue of the budget and, um, the lack of knowledge and the lack of trust of the tax administration system, the additional work that they have. And uh, 
I, I failed, I've never been able to understand why you would cut the budget of your accounts receivable function for the government unless you're purposely trying to defund the government, shrink the size of the government by Starve the beast by starving it, so to speak, um, you know, not being able to collect it. My, my point about that, that what that has been to any administration I've served under and any Congress I have talked to is to say you're not harming the IRS when you do that. They will administer the laws and they will look, if they don't have the money, they will do it with shortcuts. And what that means is you will be harming your constituents, you'll be harming your voters. Um, so there is real taxpayer harm as the result of that. Uh, what I said in this year's annual report was I don't believe in giving the IRS a blank check for the money because day to day I see so many poor decisions that they're making, not taking into consider downstream consequences of the work that creating work for themselves, creating burden for taxpayers by not looking at things in maybe the way our last panel had discussed, you know, really doing analysis and trials and, and testing things and evaluating. And so I have recommended that Congress, partly as a mechanism to gain more trust of the IRS, actually become better informed about the work that the IRS does by holding oversight hearings that are really about the work of the IRS, not about the issue of the day that we can all get exercised about, but you know, how are they doing audits and what is research showing about the best way to get you know, compliance you know, on tax assessment? And how are we doing collections? And what do we need to do? And if we have those kinds of dialogues, maybe you can get a little bit more faith and get more funding for the IRS. But I think it's going to take a lot to get there. But I mean, the funding issue is fundamental because many of the issues that we talked about today, you know, better dispute mechanism, better taxpayer rights, uh, better exchange of information, I mean, all of these things are putting enormous demands on tax administrations. And unfortunately, governments are not following up with, uh, with additional resources. Why don't we move on to the second round, which is really, um, you know, this sort of black box that your office is going to make. If you ask the average man in the street, well, what do you do as a tax officer? What do you do? How does it operate? Yeah? And, and some of the questions I'll put to you, and if you don't want to answer these, it's okay. Yeah? <laughs> Who appoints you, number one? Who do you report to? Yeah? Who funds you? And the key one, who can sack you? Yeah? So, um, who shall we, uh, why don't we begin with, maybe Diana, you can tell us what happens in Mesa. Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, I think in Mexico we have a very strong institution because I, as a head of the office, I directly appointed by the Senate, Senate, excuse me, I do not respond to any uh, authority, to any secretary of ministry, and I have my, pers my own budget and I can handle it freely. Uh, actually, for this year, we have about $40 million of budget and in the last year, we served almost 140,000 taxpayers. That, I think, are very important numbers. And we have a very relationship with SAT, with, SAT, with tax administration. Um, maybe I, I could say that in 2011, since, since 2011 that we, that we have founded, that we began our operations, we have attended 76,000 complaints. I think that, that shows the importance of the agency and the Mexican government is very, very respectful for our, our labor and progressively we have um, obtained more confidence from taxpayers. And, and uh, does the budget have to be voted every year? I mean, can they cut your budget? They can cut the budget because we have a legal disposition in our organic law. Um, but, um, according to that disposition, the Congress cannot reduce our bu budget. The so, Congress directly, excuse me, bought both our budget. Is anybody here. else in that nice, happy position? No, I'd like to move to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> So what happens, I mean, who, who, how, how do you work out in Australia? Um, look, I'm appointed by the Governor General, which is the ceremonial head of state, but effectively the cabinet or the, or the government makes the recommendation. 
Uh, I'm appointed for a term of five years. I've already had one set of five years, and I'm sort of at the tail end of my second set of five years. Did you years. have hair at the end of your first set of hair? Uh, I started job sadly without hair. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's where we are. So I've been in the job for about eight, nine years now. Um, in terms of we are a separate government agency, so the Commissioner of Taxation heads up one agency, I head up another agency. Um, the, the legislation doesn't actually create my office, it creates my position and then, you know, obviously I, I have staff. Um, the difference also is that uh, unlike, say, Nina or um, Anders, or, or um, the, the, the tax office has its own complaint unit. So I really get the ones that um, had not been resolved or they have just come to me in the first instance because they don't want to go to the tax office. So my office is considerably smaller. Um, so how, we, how many people do you have? Uh, there's about 30 of us. Um, and so we had traditionally only done <laughs> reviews into systemic tax administration issues and made recommendations for change. But as of May 2015, uh, our remit was expanded such that um, the complaint handling function with respect to the tax office and what we call the tax practitioner board, a board set up to regulate the tax profession, uh, that was transferred to us. So the Commonwealth Ombudsman, or for your purposes, the General Ombudsman, um, no longer has jurisdiction in tax. That's been transferred to my office. So that's kind of how we operate. Um, who can sack me? Unless I do something pretty silly, it would be hard for them to sack me within five years. There is, uh, there is, it's all in legislation. There's the Inspector General of Taxation Act, which has again been recently amended to include the complaint handling function. So that's largely, uh, having said that, um, I might wonder whether you could indulge me. I, I want to have an afterthought to, to the first question. And the other big challenge, I think, is also technology, yes. because so much what um, we do now, in Australia at least, it's digital. So I don't have any shop fronts. Uh, we purely deal electronically or for those that do not have access by phone, and we help them fill off the form online. Most people, it, having said that, most people still like to ring us up. Uh, but what, I, what we do do, uh, in ret and that's why we are managed to work on a much smaller staff, and we operate out of Sydney. Uh, and I thank my God every day the fact that I, I'm allowed to live in Sydney. Um, <laughs> um, it's probably uh, they just wanted a certain distance between you and the cabinet. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. <laughs> um, so that's kind of um, um, one of the reviews that I will be doing, one of the broader reviews, and this has come at the request of the Commissioner, and that is to look at the future of the tax profession. And this is in light of... Uh, you know, the, the technological steps that have been taken and how the tax profession uh, and, um, you know, again, that's a very delicate, much like um, our relationship with our respecting revenue agency, uh, the, the tax profession and the revenue agency also have a delicate relationship and there is many volu volumes written on it, including comments by the OECD. Um, so uh, I do think that technology is an issue and the evolving role of um, the tax profession and how it interacts with, with the revenue agency. Do, do any of the rest of you have respond, an oversight view of the tax profession? Yeah. I don't have, um, I have made legislative recommendations about uh, oversight and regulation of the tax profession and I've analyzed the IRS's initiatives on their preparer penalty um, uh, uh, initiatives and things like that and prepare a compliance. So I look at it through the annual report to Congress whether the oversight is helpful, whether the legi you know, whether the IRS is properly overseeing tax, tax preparers so that taxpayers are not being harmed. I think where we are in this country with, with regulation of, with, with pr tax preparers is that the vast majority of U.S. taxpayers go to preparers who are not attorneys, yeah. not certified public accountants, nor are they enrolled agents. People have taken an exam and have mm -hmm. continuing education requirements to practice before the IRS. So the vast majority of taxpayers go to people who essentially, they're either working out of some of the large chains or they're working out of pawn shops 
or massage parlors. I've found one in Texas. Massage parlors? <laughs> or, or at This dog... is the nudge factor again. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> or dog grooming parlors. We found one in one of our and in one of our local near one of our local offices. And and so you you know that's where you really bring in some of this harm to taxpayers by not creating professional standards and I've been very active in that. I suppose with IBM Watson though a lot of these people are going to disappear, yes? Maybe. Uh, and Candida. So in a lot of ways, I'm very similar to our, my position in my office is very similar to uh, Australia's. Um, I am uh, appointed by, as a, by governor and council, so our government appoints me. There is a full interview process and, and whatnot to, uh, to get to that stage. Our, we are not legislated, though, as far as uh, my position. It is created, again, by an, an order in council. And the staff that we have are actually CRA employees. I believe, is that similar to uh, the US? I'm not sure. Does that sort of pose a certain constraint? Or pardon me? Does that impose a certain constraint? Or, I mean, how do well, it, it does cause a bit of constraint, um, but it is useful in that they have information about the uh, tax authority. And they do a very good job of putting on their separate hat and uh, very much becoming um, members of the Office of the Taxpayers Ombudsman. Um, but So we're set up, we're not legislated, but we are set up as a, a, an order in council creating our, our, our office and we do manage our own budget. Um, it is approximately three million Canadian dollars. Three million. Yeah, I have about twenty. No zeros on the end, then. Yeah? No, no extra zeros. <laughs> Don't get the billions in there. But um, we have about twenty-three employees in our office. One of the things that's very unique to our office is we're created to deal only with mm -hmm. service-related mm -hmm. issues. Now we can find a service um, aspect to pretty much most anything, but there are certain things that uh, definitely are not service related. We have a Taxpayer Bill of Rights um, as well, but it is not legislated. And so there comes with that certain problems and certain advantages um, with that, and we've heard some discussion today on that. Um, thinking, was there, what were the, was there anything else you were wondering about how we were set up? Who can sack you? Oh, I'm appointed, yeah, good one. I'm appointed for a five-year term, and it's non-renewable. So that does bring so with just it one. just one five-year term. So there are a number of uh, issues with that. Uh, longevity and your, your fourth issue of looking to the future becomes problematic. Um, but I can't be sacked without cause. So unless I do something very drastic, I'm, I'm in there for the full five years. Okay, now we, we've heard from the, the sort of the, the very rich, the reasonably rich. <laughs> what about the poor side of the house? Yes, sir. And this, tell us. I mean, we, we will pass a begging bowl around at the end. So you, thank tell you us, you, this is your moment of fame. Yeah. yeah thank you very much. Well, in, in Sweden, the ombudsman is um, um, a function within the tax administration, so it's not a separate entity. Uh, it's government who appoints the ombudsman and. Uh, it's never been tried, but I'm pretty sure that it's government who can suck the ombudsman. <laughs> uh, I don't think the agency can do that. Uh, it's a six-year period, and it can be pro prolonged for another six-year period. Uh, my predecessor sat for 14 years, I think. Uh, the funding is, uh, as you say, a little bit uh, particular, because there's no, uh, apart from my salary and the travels and so, there's no particular budget. Instead, I, there's, a, there's a rule in the law saying that I can get the resources that I need from the agency. So, oh, so the agency has to give you the resources? Yeah, well, uh, it doesn't say resources. It says can, I can employ officers there to, uh, to try my cases. And what happens in practice is that I work with the legal department and, and when there's a case that I want to try, if I don't want to do it myself, uh, I, uh, I call the legal department and they will send someone who's an expert in that area of the law. This doesn't work really, uh, it worked okay in some instances, but and there's other instances where the legal department and I don't have really the same object. So I've asked government in my report for 2016 to give me my staff and my own, but I also said I want to keep the possibility to use uh, Officers of the legal department, because sometimes, you know, it's a very waste 
area of law. Sometimes you need experts on mm. other. Um, what's there, who do you report to? Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, it, it, it exists in the Ombudsman since 2004, and there's never been a report until mm. 2016. Mm. So uh, this year was the first time I gave my report, and I give my report to government. With no censorship, it just went straight to government? It went straight to government. And you still have a job? I, I, yeah, I still have a job. <laughs> but this well, was only eight days ago, so I don't know. So you may not have a job by the time you get back, yeah. I, I, I think, in fact, you know, you should probably take Diana back with you to, to Stockholm, and she can explain how a real ombudsman should work, yes? <laughs> You're very welcome. You know, what, one of, just before we move on to the next one, what, how, how and what sort of access do you have to the information that's held in the tax administration files? Oh, sorry. <laughs> would you like to say something? Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought I would just talk a little bit about my office. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm a, a, my office is run by legislation that uh, is it was created in 1998. Although it had it's, there was predecessor legislation and administrative. Um, organization from the 1970s and then moving through the 80s, but in 1998 they created the function known as the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate and the position of the National Taxpayer Advocate. And the law says that um, the National Taxpayer Advocate is appointed by the Secretary of the Treasury, um, but reports to the Commissioner of Internal Revenue. So, like Anders, I am inside um, the Internal Revenue Service uh, by law reporting directly to the Commissioner, uh, but he, has n he cannot fire me and he cannot hire me, that it is the Secretary of the Treasury that hires and fires. There is no set term. I am an at-will employee. I could be told to go away tomorrow. Um, there is one interesting requirement on hiring and work after being the National Taxpayer Advocate, which was trying to deal with the balancing of putting the position inside the IRS but creating independence. The, the statute requires that the person who fills this role have experience representing individual taxpayers before the IRS. So you actually have to have been outside, you know, representing taxpayers in disputes with the IRS. Um, and have a customer service background as well. Also says that you cannot have worked for the IRS for two years before you take this position, and you cannot work for the IRS for five years after you leave this position. So you basically have no career path inside the IRS for a significant amount of time um, after you leave the position, and that is actually a lot of freedom. Um, my funding is part of the IRS budget, but since 2000 and I want to say 2006 fiscal year, when in 2005 the then commissioner tried to cut and gut my budget, um, Congress intervened and wrote into the annual appropriation law a minimum funding level for my office within the IRS budget. So I do have to go up every year and convince them to do that every year, but since 2006 we have had a minimum funding level. And within the last three years, even though the IRS itself has experienced significant cuts, my, my office has maintained status quo, which is actually you know, a cut de facto, but it is not an active cut. Um, I have a budget right now, it's about $206 million a year. And um, I get about, we have two functions, case advocacy, where we get 225,000 to 250,000 cases a year, um, 1,800 employees, 77 offices around the United States. By law, I have to have one office in each state. We have several states where we have many, we have more than one because they're larger or more populous. And then we have um, systemic advocacy where we work on issues not pertaining to individual, you know, you, one by one, one-off cases, but working on issues that impact all, you know, groups of taxpayers. And I guess, you know, the other thing that I would say is that when you come into ta taxpayer advocate service, uh, 
with you have to have significant hardship, and that is described by the law in the law that either there's something the IRS is doing or not doing or about to do that creates significant hardship for the taxpayer, which can be economic harm, or that they've really tried the system is broken down mm -hmm. and they've tried to solve the problem in some other way, and it just has been not resolved. And then I guess for the reports, you know, I have two reports a year that go directly to Congress. The law says that my boss, the commissioner, my big boss, the secretary of the treasury, um, the office of management and budget, no IRS employee other than my own can see those reports before I deliver them to the House Ways and Means and Senate Finance Committee. And then the commissioner gets a copy. This is pretty impressive. I mean, Eric, and how does it work in South Africa? Yeah? Well, in, in the, the questions that you asked relate a lot to in the issues of independence. And uh, the, the appointment of the ombud is done by the minister. And the report is also is to the, the minister, minister, of finance, the minister of Finance, who is also <coughs> responsible for the Revenue Authority. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the term is five years. It used to be three years up till uh, January this year. We made proposals to, to the effect that uh, many of our counterparts at least have it five years, mm -hmm. uh, five year term. Um, so that is, was increased from uh, three years uh, to five years. I mean, three years you can uh, barely blink and it's over. Uh, first year you're trying to know what you're doing and uh, you know, second year you're looking for a job. <laughs> so, but it's renewable. Uh, uh, which is good. Now, the other issue, uh, it also relates to uh, issues of independence, which is this appointment of staff. All the staff gets appointed, it will say, in terms of the SARS Act. Until January this year, uh, there had to be a consultation between the commissioner and the ombud on every appointment. So that suggested that you know, the commissioner could influence on the appointment of staff uh, for the office of the, uh, of the ombud. Now, we've made proposals to change that. There's no need to consult. The ombud can appoint his own staff uh, as he wishes. And uh, the other thing was the funding. It also was a problem mm -hmm. until uh, January this year. Um, Previously, the funding could be coming out of the revenue agency, and uh, that compromised our independence as well. So we said this one must be changed as well. So the minister now, whom we report to, determines the budget uh, for the office. So that is one of those are a couple of things that needed to uh, put them to bed and just to re eliminate perception of uh, 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 of lack of independence. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, in, but another issue that we also introduced, which was absent in our mandate, was um, initiating an investigation or systemic investigation. We couldn't do that. We were limited to only the complaints that were coming in, which was not really helping us a lot. Um, so uh, we have also made a proposal to change that to include uh, the ability to initiate uh, the systemic investigations. And that because sometimes revenue authority, uh, people are scared of revenue authority. You know, some people may not bring a complaint out in the open, but they may be prepared to give information. Uh, so that is one of the achievements that we, and, and we're not limited to service. We're limited to, we can do a, a procedural aspects mm -hmm. uh, and administrative issues um, relating to the application mm -hmm. of the uh, tax legislation. So that is, I mean, it's a, for a start, we're eliminating issues that uh, are compromising our independence. It sounds as though you make a lot of progress in a short period of time. Maybe just one question for all of you, this one of, um, what access do you have to the information in the tax administration's file? Do you have to rely on the taxpayer giving it to you? Or you know, do you have a computer in your office that you can just press the button and I'm looking at you, Ali, yeah? yeah. I'll, I'll take that one if you like. Um, yes, so what we do whilst I'm outside of the tax office, all my staff, first of all, bar a couple of support staff, are all tax specialists. And they have two computers on their desk. One is our own system and the other one straight into the tax office. So we ha And also we have very wide-ranging access powers. I can even take 
evidence on the oath from tax officers. I've not had to do that. But, you know, it's tempting before I finish up. We'll see, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Just a couple of quick ones. Um, I forgot to say, I do have my own budget. Um, I can't direct the Commissioner to do anything, and he can't tell me what to do. But the good thing is that there is public reporting. All my reports are on our website and are public. I think that is the right way because it puts the pressure on me to make sensible recommendations but it also puts the pressure on the administration that not to reject my recommendation unless they have jolly good reasons. Um, the couple of other things is um, the relationship. Are you going to come to that, or can I just say something briefly about it, the relationship? Uh, we'll come to that in a minute. Okay. Yeah. The relationship is a very important one, yeah? Well, the relationship is just that um, I think there needs to be a natural tension between officers yeah. such as ours and the revenue agency. And professionally managed, I think it's right, because you know uh, <laughs> there needs to be that tension to make sure that there is real independence, both real and perceived by the community. Um, you know, occasionally throw, uh, toys may be thrown out of the pram, but it, it's important that that relationship is always professional. Mm -hmm. And you know, whenever there is a change in staffing or if there is a change in our legislation. There is always a little bit of, you know, um, feeling each other out. But I think ultimately it needs to be a professional relationship with a degree of natural mm -hmm. tension. And we've come to that issue in a moment. I mean, what about this side of the table on this access? I mean, uh, I, Nina, can you just go straight into the phone, Dan? Well, I was just going to say that that's a, that's a huge issue for my office. I mean, the reason, one of the two reasons why we're inside the IRS is is on the case side and the research side to have access to all of the IRS mm -hmm. systems. And that also goes to the systemic side to, be, to have access, immediate access, and unmediated access to IRS decision making and the employees who are making the decisions. Um, I can't tell you how much, how often I find out things walking the hallways of various IRS offices and have hallway conversations mm. that I will never mm. see a piece of paper on. And that's, you know... You sort that, of hang around in the corridors, isn't Yeah, it? all those people. <laughs> but um, I will say that we, in the last few years, we have experienced, and I personally have experienced, more um, resistance to giving us access to taxpayer files or being able to attend taxpayer meetings with the IRS when the cases are open and active mm -hmm. in our office. Um, and there is no legal basis for that. Under 6103, the tax confidentiality law, mm -hmm. I have access to any information, return or return information that I need to execute my tax administration duties. Mm -hmm. And they are very, very broad. Mm -hmm. But we, I routinely have to go and get the lawyers of the IRS to say, really, do you want this battle? I mean, this is ridiculous. However, we have recommended to Congress this year, and we have some legislation that has, is about to be introduced and was introduced last year again, making it clear that I have access, you know, ordering the IRS, requiring the IRS to give us that access to the information. They cannot deny us that, and they cannot, cannot deny us participating in a conference between the taxpayer and the IRS if the taxpayer asks for it. So it's been a new tension that I haven't seen before. Canada. We don't have any direct access to any information. So that is a big problem for us. We operate through the what's called the Ombudsman Liaison Office. And any requests for information, we uh, put through that office. They obtain the information. And, and the CRA, our, our revenue agency, is a very large um, organization, over 44,000 employees spread across the country. So it is useful to have that office to assist us in figuring out where to go. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, we don't have that direct information. And so it does make things, it takes longer to, uh, to resolve any individual complaints. And it also takes longer. We do uh, systemic examinations as well. Mm -hmm. So while we can do our own open source research, we have to go to the CRA to get the um, details and information from them. We get consent from the taxpayer um, for us to provide information to the CRA, and likewise we get their consent for the tax agency to provide us with their information. So we operate very independently um, in that sense. And one thing I should just expand on, and the previous question is, um, 
although my agent, my, my employees are CRA employees, um, we do operate independently and we report, I report directly to the Minister of uh, National Revenue. So in our country we have Minister of National Revenue and we also have a Finance Minister. So one deals with money in, the other deals with money going out. Um, and so the Minister of National Revenue, her portfolio is solely the Canada Revenue Agency and myself. So I report to her as, and the Commissioner of the Canada Revenue Agency reports directly to her as well. So you probably spend a lot of your time in the corridors then, yes? Well, we're actually located in a different building altogether. Oh. So because of the independence and impartiality, we cannot be located or we've made the decision we will not be located in any building that has CRA um, offices. In South yeah. Africa? Yeah, we, we, have, uh, we have full access. Sorry, we, we have full access to the Revenue Authority uh, data, uh, and that is legislated. So it's, it's uh, covered by the legislation that we shall have full access to, to their records. And the last one, Sweden. I don't, do not have direct access to the database of the Mexican Tax Administration, but I have a very powerful, fac powerful faculty. I can request any kind of information from Tax Administration, and Tax Administration is obliged by law to answer me in a very brief term. That's it. I don't have direct access today. I've never been denied any uh, uh, documents when I asked for them, uh, but I, I said in my yearly report that I want direct access, and I think that's really important for all the reasons that Nina has stated. You know, I think that's the, for me, it's the, um, be, uh, the, the purpose of being inside the organisation is that you have free information flow. So, but but the legal department is deliberating on. This. <laughs> Deliberating, yeah. Uh, there is an ombuds at the Social Security Agency, and the law is exactly the same, and she has direct access. So yeah, they yeah. made different deliberations. That's the case you can go litigate. Yes, <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, just listening, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see you, know, you have similar functions, but you're structured in very, very different ways. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that just reflects your own culture, your own political environment, mm -hmm. and your own administrative environment, yeah? Um, why don't we move on then to the, the, the third round, which is really picking up Mali, what you were saying of this. Um, you know, what type of relationship do your offices have with the tax administration? You can't get too close, but you need to, you know, I think the, the word I liked was sort of a, a creative tension. Yeah? Is that a, a sort of a good way? Nina, maybe creative tension sounds like something you want to talk about? <laughs> um. I think that uh, when I first came that there was more than just creative tension. It was um, who is this person and why is she here and why is she saying these things. Um, and I, there was active, you know, don't tell, don't tell Nina that we just had this meeting or that we discussed this. And these are the badges people had on their things, isn't it? It was don't tell Nina. Um, <laughs> But the silly thing about that, of course, is that, of course, you knew within five minutes that there had been this meeting and that they had discussed this thing that should not have been told to Nina. Um, and I think over time, people have sort of gotten used to the idea of the role of the taxpayer advocate. What I think affects them the most is when I make a decision that the IRS has not been responsive to things that I've been trying to address internally with them. And, and make what I think are perfectly reasonable recommendations, understanding their tensions and everything like that and their budget concerns and all that, but that my, my portfolio is to advocate for taxpayers. And that when I make the decision that it's, that we, I've gone as far as I can and I've exercised enough patience and taxpayers are being harmed, uh, I go public through my annual reports or in testimony to Congress and that often gets people unhappy, particularly at the highest levels of the IRS. And um, I, I find that unavoidable. You know, that is my job, to make that decision and to decide when it is that I need to go public and um, when I need to bring pressure other than the internal pressure and the internal conversations. And it's a hard decision to make because you're losing some willingness for people to work with you inside, but on the other hand, if they haven't been really working with me inside, then what am I losing? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you sort of have to think through that and then just in your gut, really, 
get to that point and then say, I'm willing to take the heat. Mm. And uh, I think this is the right thing to do. Does it depend on personalities? I mean, the, you know, the, the, the character of the commissioner must be an important factor, no? I think it's a matter of style. Um, that's the, I've had five commissioners now, I think. And um, I think it's a matter of style. I, I really try hard not to take whatever's happening personally. And I think I do that pretty, I mean, I can, I can live with myself. Um, but I do think you have to be very sensitive and adapt to style. But again, there's going to be a point, and I've had this point with every single commissioner I've worked for, where they have gotten angry with me about something that I have felt I needed to go public with. And I am very comfortable living with their anger. And um, it's not personal. I don't take it personally, but I'm, I understand it as a consequence of the tension of being inside the agency and having a platform to be able to address things. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, that's a creative tension, having a platform, annoying the commissioner. Um, so far, the relationship has been excellent. Uh, we, we, we've had a very good relationship. However, I just must point out that sometimes a legislation is crafted in such a way that it's accommodating personalities. Uh, instead of really setting out the boundaries and, and the relationship between the, uh, the, you know, the parties. Now, if I may give an example, uh, we, the commissioner and the ombud report to the minister. Now, you also need to have a relationship, a very great relationship between the three parties. Mm -hmm. So that uh, may really work well under normal circumstances. But in South Africa, currently, we have this public spat, you know, between the commissioner and the minister. So, uh, in a way, it does, it may draw us into that fold. Uh, it's something that we really have to be cautious, that we focus on the job. But uh, because we are accountable to one minister, and uh, if the minister is not having a good relationship with the, with the commissioner, if there's an issue that we raise with the minister, uh, the minister may probably not be able to deal with the issue properly. Uh, and, and, you know, the, what is even complex is the fact that the commissioner gets appointed by the president. Yes. So you, you have that, you know, but on a personal level, we definitely have a very good working relationship. He has been supportive, even supporting the, the proposals that we've made for legislative changes. Anders. Well, I think in terms of the relationship, um, some of the particulars of, of, of my role um, demands that I have a close collaboration with the, with the agency because uh, I, I can appeal the decision that the agency makes, but I also have to apply for advance notice uh, on behalf of the state. And, and, and the work with an application like that is very much a joint venture between the taxpayer, the legal department, myself and also maybe the tax officer that has the initial tax litigation um, and um, maybe you have one relationship with the tax agency when you have a project like that and then you're supposed to have maybe a little bit of a different relation when it comes to appealing a decision mm -hmm. on behalf of a taxpayer uh, when, when um, the tax agency don't think it's anything wrong with that decision. Right. So um, I struggled a little bit with these um, questions of the relationship, but I've, 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 uh, the gut feeling, I think, is good. You mm -hmm. have to take it day by day. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, sometimes people call me up and they ask, for, how do you interpret the law in this case? And, and I wonder, should I answer that, people from within the agency? But then I think, well, it's better that I tell them now than I appeal the decision tomorrow. And, and in many cases, they, they follow my advice, and then there is no litigation, and that's better for everybody. But I think, you know, still there has to be some kind of principles guiding this, and I think I would have to think more about this in the future. We have to learn. You know, if I may, may say yeah. something, you know, in, in 2005, I sort of reached a... a you know, a personal watershed because we, we were really identifying an issue in my annual report in 2005 where 
I thought, I, I really felt that there were constitutional due process violations going on by the IRS. And we had worked on this issue for two and a half years, and they had been in denial and then um, disputed our numbers and then back into denial. And, uh, you know, I thought, I just have to come public with this. And I really had this moment, because I knew that the, uh, the commissioner and um, it was an issue involving criminal investigations, so I had the guys with the guns and badges, you know, looking at me, um, that I thought, you know, if nobody cares about this issue, like I write this piece and nobody cares about the issue, they will fire me. And I really had to have a moment, you know, where I thought to myself, like, why am I in this job? You know, why am I in this job? You know, so that I don't make something public that I think is really important because I might get fired or because something really important is happening and I need to bring attention to it and I may get fired, but what's my job? And I really came to the conclusion that the only thing that I had to really think about in those kind of moments of crisis was could I live with myself the next day? I live in my own skin and could I live in my own skin with whatever decision I made? And as it turned out, um, we went public. The New York Times wrote a lead op-ed, editorial, not op-ed, editorial, about our report and the issue in the report. Um, Forty-three congressmen wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury, and the commissioner was called back from one of the meetings overseas to talk about all I was at that he meeting, so I remember, yes. <laughs> and he was called back from overseas, I think it was Korea, South Korea, South Korea yeah. very quickly to address the concerns that came from that, and I had job security for quite some time more as a result. <laughs> but it very easily could have gone the other way, and I really had to face that. And that really changed, you know, it was just really asking yourselves, like, why am I in this job? And if you, can't, if you can't face that kind of thing, then frankly, you shouldn't be in the job, is what I think. So, Ali, have you had a moment like that? Um, well, look, I think um, it's not about personalities. At the end of the day, it's about professional relationships. But however, we did have a uh, new commissioner recently, and uh, as a result, there was a scrutiny, as uh, there was a parliamentary inquiry as to whether... Uh, the tax office is over scrutinized and um, that was a moment where I felt I made two, you can go online and look at the submissions I made and um, I didn't hold back um, <laughs> and I think um, and I do also speak in the media but uh, I take a slightly different approach and that is it's a little bit like a um, uh, it's like a car that, that the alarm goes off every other second uh, if it goes off too often, you know, you just ignore the alarm. So, I, in, uh, And also you've got to understand the geopolitical differences between our respective jurisdictions. And um, my judgment has been that, um, you know, you need occasionally a well-timed public uh, display of what is really going on. Uh, and at other times it's best to work with the administration. So, for example, when it comes to the reviews that I've done, sometimes I will not compromise on a recommendation, even though I know the, the, the ATO will disagree with it because it's too important, it's a matter of principle. Other times I think, okay, well, I can't get my Rolls Royce this time, but maybe it's better to have a Ford on this occasion. Um, I don't want to insult the Americans. But the, clearly, Roy Joyce is a better car. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm willing to compromise with a Ford model on this occasion because it's important that taxpayers have some immediate relief. Um, so I think it's a matter of judgment, and I think um, we all need to temper a degree of uh, diplomacy, a degree of um, uh, courage uh, at the same time. Um, and I think we all um, make those decisions. And as Nina said, it, it's not, we do not make those decisions lightly uh, because it's very important if you want to get results. Um, sometimes a, a public outburst may be counterproductive, whereas at other times it may be just what's required. In a sense, I mean, it raises the interesting issue of your, your relationship with the media, yeah? yeah? How far do you consciously think about how you can use the media? when you pull back? Uh... I think the media plays a very important role 
in order to we can properly develop our our tax our faculties in Mexico when I think uh, some act some um, behavior of the tax authority is not the correct I can issue a bulletin press and I frequently do that and in that kind of of, 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 of news, I rebel even the name of the tax authority involved. The tax official. The, yes, the tax officer, excuse me, involved in the violation of the rights. Mm -hmm. But even uh, such kind of, of powers, we have a very good relationship with tax administration. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our relationship is based in mutual understanding. And the tax authority see us more, more than an ally, than an yeah. opponent. And I think um, this is a um, task that we constantly are developing in order to have the best relationship possible in the, on behalf of the taxpayers' rights. Mm -hmm. In Canada? It's constant balance. Um, <laughs> and I, I think it's the type of thing where if there isn't some sort of tension, we have to question why. Um, it's the type of thing where there's always going to need to be some sort of tension. It's the nature of the beast, so to speak. It's what, what we do. Um, for us, we, we try to work collaboratively, too, because we need to get our information. But also, um, part of my office's mandate is to resolve things at the lowest possible level. So we do try to work with um, the revenue agency to make sure that we can resolve things where possible at that lowest level. And we do that especially on individual um, um, complaints and individual examinations. On the systemic examinations, often we do find in the course of doing a full examination, by the time we reach the end of it, the revenue agency has done and made most of the changes, if not all of the changes, that we would have recommended. Um, if those changes haven't been made, though, then our recommendations are made to the Minister for acceptance and, and implementation. But it is a constant, um, a constant balancing act to keep the independence, keep the neutrality, uh, keep the relationships so that you can work together and, and serve taxpayers in the best way possible. But I think it's a necessary um, balance, um, necessary <coughs> thing that you need to have. Sorry, can I, Jeffrey, just yeah. one thing, if I may. I think the way we make it work, I think when the Commissioner and I get together, as long as we put at the centre of our discussion what is best for the system, we end up agreeing to something. Um, and sometimes, with going public, that hardens their position to their existing one. Um, so I generally use that as the last resort. Um, but I think as long as we acknowledge that we are all working together, and if uh, particularly the, the revenue agency appreciates that maybe there might be some short-term pain, but long-term officers like ours are good for confidence in the system, which as Professor Kirschler would say, ultimately l leads yep. to better compliance behaviour. And, and if I may, on, on that, the corollary of the going public, make, making them harden into their position that they're currently in, the corollary is that sometimes us going public or our office making a recommendation can actually help the tax administration in something they've been looking for. Um, if they've been seeing that there is um, some, something that's needing further funding or they need some change or something, having us independently say that yes, that is needed can actually be helpful to the agency as well. I think that's absolutely correct, yes. Why don't we throw the floor open to some questions? We have about 15 minutes, yes, so um, who would like to put some questions? Um, nothing personal. If you have a tax problem from one of these countries, don't raise it, yeah? Just announce your name, please, and affiliation, yeah? My name is André Laroux from Canada. Nina, um, you work with taxpayers' files. They come to see you. Are you allowed to work on a taxpayer's file without his or her consent uh, in order for her, him or her to get a benefit from your work. So if you have discovered that there's something that the person, the taxpayer, should get, but doesn't, the taxpayer doesn't know that this benefit is available. And that's my first, And the second question is, 
uh, would you or could you work on a taxpayer's file without her or his consent if this is for the public benefit? Well, so the statute basically gives the national taxpayer advocate the authority to um, issue a taxpayer assistance order which is ordering the IRS to do something about a taxpayer, even if the taxpayer hasn't initiated, if I develop regulations about that process. And we sort of have regulations that address that. It's, it would be sort of unique where that might come up is more in a systemic area. So for example, we're looking at some process or some issue the IRS is doing. We've identified a problem by other cases where taxpayers have come in, maybe saying, I'm not getting my refund on this time. And as we look at why specific taxpayers in specific cases aren't getting their refund, we will find that it's a systemic problem. And then I would order the IRS if they didn't do what we asked them nicely first, which normally they do actually, um, to release all refunds in that situation, which would involve a taxpayer who hadn't come into us. Um, and then another way we might get into that is through some of the research that we're, we do, you know, our research studies where we are, we don't have a case, but we're doing some research studies and we're uncovering things as part of that research. And we'll go to the IRS and say, here are the numbers, you've done something wrong or you've missed something and you need to address that. Yes, I can. That that is, that is, again, under 6103, I can, I can have access to tax return and tax return information um, if it is in furtherance of my tax administration duties. So if I am looking at a, an issue and I, need, and I determine that I need to look at taxpayer files in order to figure out what is really going on with that issue, I can do that. And most often I can do that with, I, my employees have, and my research staff in particular, have access to many, many IRS databases so that we do not have to ask the IRS to get us that information. Um, there are only a few that we don't have access to and that we have to go through the IRS, and that's really mainly limitation on there are only a certain number of licenses to have access to that, and we just don't have one. But otherwise, I, I don't have to ask an IRS employee to get us that data. My staff can get us, pull us that data. Which is a big advantage, I think. It Dan, is. you want to say something? No. no. Well, in our case, I think it's, it's important that we can, as I previously mentioned, ask tax administration of any kind of information related to, such, to a specific taxpayer or related to systemic tax problems. We can uh, also request the internal strategies of the tax administration. I think we have important powers there, then there, excuse me, because if tax administration do not, does not respond to us, we can impose even an economic penalty to the officer involved. That's interesting. Yeah. It's really interesting. And some more questions? Can I have that authority? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, we'll we, we make sure that these people are sitting at the same table over, over dinner, yeah, because I think there's some interesting practices you can share, yeah? Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. My question is about the uh, taxpayers' rights. So presumably you all took uh, the, uh, uh, the sort of central role in writing down the Bill of Rights or uh, the equivalent document. So I saw uh, today at the presentation that the uh, European model uh, taxpayer rights list includes the right for certainty, whereas it was not in the list uh, in the uh, American Bill of Taxpayer Rights or the UK, your charter. So my question is whether it was a, a deliberate omission because uh, it is impossible to guarantee a certainty or well, this was more thank culture. You. I do believe it's in there. It's the right to finality. But um, when we did the focus groups, people had no idea what we meant by certainty. And so we, met, we played around with different words and we ended up with finality. And um, 
so that's that's what that one stands for. Now, it's in the description of it talks about the you know statu statutory periods of limitation for assessment or collection or things like that. But it also means you know you can't keep these things going on and on and on. That the taxpayer has a right to f get an answer and with a certain amount of time and ha and and have some sense of what they need to do. I would also say that certainty has an overlap with the right to be informed. And that really goes to that the agency has an obligation to tell the taxpayer what they expect of them. And having done that, then, you, then the taxpayer has a right to say, if I follow what you've told me, you are not going to nail me on this. And so you get that, there's an overlap of these rights, I think. Other questions? In the front. Peter Essos, Tilburg University. Um, there might be cases in which your reports, your findings, have influenced the legislator to change the law. Can you give us some spectacular examples? Well, um, I am the only employee in the IRS who is authorized to make legislative recommendations to Congress without anyone in the federal government seeing them except for me or my staff. So I don't have to go through the Treasury Department or the Office of Tax Policy to make those recommendations. I do them through the annual report to Congress. That's the law. And I think at this point we've got somebody else, Karen, how many? It's like 16 at this point have been rec enacted into law. But if you look at my report, how many? 30? Well, there you go. Um, either that or through regulation. A lot of times we've tried to get the IRS to adopt something through regulation and they say they can't and when I make a legislative recommendation they miraculously find out that they could change it by regulation rather than Congress changing it. So um, that's not a bad percentage. Congress hasn't been doing a lot of legislation over the last few years. Um, and it's, it's, we, try, we don't do tax policy, we do tax administration kind of recommendations. So one of the ones that was my first legislative recommendation when I came into office was that we had six definitions of a child in the Internal Revenue Code. And it was creating great chaos and creating some of the problems with the earned income credit and other things. And so I proposed a uniform definition of a qualifying child. What that a, must have been really controversial. What a, well, it was highly controversial. <laughs> and um, it took until 2004 to enact the first phase of it. I've been recommending, including this year's report, changes to the structure um, even since then to get the second half of what I thought needed to be done. But it was very pragmatic in looking at taxpayer burden and also looking at improper payments that we were, mm. that Les was talking about. Like how can you change the law so that you reduce the improper payments? And I have access to all the IRS data about what are some of the sources of those improper payments and I could bring that to bear on the legislative proposal. And sometimes with my legislative proposals, um, there is no disagreement within the Treasury Department. It's just that they can't get it through no. the review process. And I have actually had folks in Treasury send me legislative proposals that they've worked up and asked me to propose them. And I've, you know, I've looked at them and thought, gee, that's a great idea. I'll be glad to take credit for that one. You know, but I mean, I will, those people remain nameless. You know, but I mean, there is a dynamic there. So they're a great relationship. How do you get a comment on um, I also have uh, the power to make legislation. In fact, the only power I have under the legislation is to make recommendations for government for a change of law. Uh, but practically, most of our recommendations are to the tax office. Um, yes, in our annual report, I usually list every year the number of uh, policy recommendations. And again, it's limited to tax administration rather than policy. Uh, and we list the recommendation that the government has implemented. Uh, I think the ones that come to mind are the ones um, to do with superannuation. I mean, I also uh, made recommendations about having more externals because a lot of the, the current commissioner who is from the private sector, usually all previous commissioners had been come through the system. Uh, they were all, you know, career public servants. And one of the recommendations I had made was there should be more from the private sector. Uh, so there's quite a lot. If you look at our annual report, it's online. Every year I do list them. 
Um, we also list recommendations that the tax office initially disagreed with, but over time have <laughs> come to our way of thinking. So we do also claim those. So if you go through our annual report, they're all there. Well, I think we've got to stop here. I mean, that's something you, you have a fascinating type of job. You have different approaches, same objectives. And the key thing I think that I've taken away from this, you just need to be very, very politically savvy to be in your positions. Yes? So thank you very much to the panel. It's been a great debate. Thank you to the, the audience. Um, the, uh, and thank you also to Rene and Melody, who actually set this fireside chat up. That was really good.